Killen, and I'm host of The Killen Report, a television show. We are filming in Art Ventures Gallery in Menlo Park, and I have to thank Katarina for inviting us to be here. And my guests today are the former mayor of Palo Alto and a man who's going to represent us in the the state of California, selection of maybe the next delegates. You can clear that up later. And Bill Whitmer, who is presently the mayor of Atherton, and I think this is the second time he's mayor. And when he's not the mayor, he's a councilman. I'm going to ask both of these gentlemen, what advice do they have for other cities around the nation, around the world, for what they should do to minimize the threat of climate change, especially in the era of Trump. I'll start out with Pat. Pat, how are you tonight? I'm good, thanks, Michael. Good, and I think you have a plan to be selected to go to the National Democratic Convention for the 2020 election, is that correct? Well, actually, I think what you're referring to is we had recently a selection process for the state Democratic Convention, and I'm a delegate there, and we'll see um, uh, what happens when we go through the primary process in early 2020 for the, for the National Convention. And when that happens, I encourage you to come on my show, and we'll discuss your qualifications and what you want to do, okay, Very for good. the good of the community. So. Um, you have been a leader for many, many years in helping Palo Alto be a leader in reducing greenhouse gases and, in other word, ways, uh, improving the quality of life of that city. What is the most important thing that Palo Alto has done to help reduce greenhouse gases? Well, I think the most important important thing that we've done to date was being one of the first cities globally to have 100% carbon-free electricity. And why that matters is not so much because of the relatively small global impact that we can have directly. It's whether, it's how cities like ours were able to influence other cities throughout the world and by being leaders and demonstrating that we could not only do it, but do it at, at electricity costs one third below PG&E. And it showed that 100% clean electricity uh, could be cheap electricity. And those two things of a vibrant economy uh, and, and a, uh, a low cost were not in competition with 100% um, carbon free electricity. And that has had an impact of the collective impact of cities globally uh, was a big part of what led to the Paris Climate Accord. So the most important thing you have done is to help the city provide it with 100% clean energy, right? That's correct. And I remember having a discussion with you sometime in the past where I think you were saying to me, Michael, we're working on changing the codes of the city to decrease, discourage builders, buyers of homes, whatever, of using gas in their house, except for maybe cooking. Uh, is my memory correct? Uh, yes, uh, generally, although it actually includes cooking. So um, when, we, when we went to 100% carbon-free electricity, we said, well, what remains? And the, the, there were three buckets of carbon emissions that remain. Our transportation, which is over half of the remainder, uh, our waste and, and, and the processes of dealing with that waste, uh, which is about 10% of the remainder, and the balance is our buildings, commercial buildings and our residences. And the, really the easiest thing to do is to begin the process of having new buildings rely on 100% clean electricity. Uh, the bigger and more difficult nut to crack is how we retrofit all of the massive amount of building that we already have. 
and that's the next challenge. Uh, when we first started doing this, we really didn't have a plan on how to get to those next points. It's starting to emerge. But what have you done besides those two important uh, actions? On the, on the buildings or more broadly? Let's take the buildings. Okay. Um, so what we're doing in those two, we've, I should break it down. We have first a continuation of a program that we had actually begun almost 20 years ago, which is our energy efficiency programs in both electricity and uh, uh, methane. I, I, I'm trying to wean myself from even using the term natural gas. Okay. Um, but uh, we have been, over the course of that 20 years, steadily reducing our use of those materials, even as our population and workforce have grown. And we not only have significantly less per capita, we have on an absolute level, less electricity we're using, less natural gas by a lot. Less water we're using. A lot of our energy in this state is, goes into uh, dealing with water on transporting, purifying, and treating wastewater. Um, and um, less waste generation. We have, we've achieved an 80% uh, reduction in our, in our waste. So that combination okay is what puts the whole package together. Now, when we started this interview, you brought up leadership. And you know, I've been in conferences sitting next to mayors of other cities. And when I, I used to live in Palo Alto, as you know. And when I mentioned Palo Alto, they'd immediately say, oh, you're in that city that always has to be the leader. So I don't really think of it that way. Um, my, and uh, I'll see different civic leaders kind of feel competitively, and I feel much more collaborative. Um, my notion of leadership is to share, not to beat. And what we want to do is uh, share whatever we can do and model that and borrow from others who are doing yes. things that are better than what we're doing in, on different areas, are more cutting edge. Um, we, have, we were helped lead by grassroots programs in Palo Alto of a carbon-free Palo Alto group, but there's a phenomenal one now in Menlo Park that is doing great work on focusing on elimination of natural gas use. Before I start asking Bill some questions, you use again the term leadership. What is the significance of being a leader? I think it is to be able to provide models that others can copy and emulate and build upon and improve upon uh, so that we leverage what we do 10, 100, 1,000 times. That's the value in my book. Good. Bill, Bill Widma, you are the mayor of Atherton. Currently, yes. And how many times have you been a mayor? This is my second time. I've been vice mayor twice as well. I'm in my third term. And I first came in contact with you years ago when somebody said to me, you were the driving force developing the, I always forget how to say it, you, you know what I'm talking about, the waste management system. Right. So, say South Bayside Waste Management Authority. South Bayside Waste Management Authority. Authority. And you, I believe, worked with multiple cities, mostly, I think, in San Mateo County and also San Francisco County, to create that organization? Well, we, what we've got is 12 jurisdictions, including uh, the unincorporated part of San Mateo County uh, and also uh, West Bay Sanitation District. And so it's the lower end of San Mateo County, um, and we arranged for not only uh, pickup of trash and recyclables at, uh, at homes as well as businesses, but then transport them and then sort them. Right now we have a, what's called a multi-stream uh, facility where we'll bring in things in different buckets and then we'll sort through the recyclables and then clean them up as best we can to get them off to people who actually will recycle them and repurpose them. Um, but we're also looking now at, with the need for taking more of the organics out of the, uh, the trash stream and then using that to convert to energy, 
we're looking at uh, just around to implement a new or uh, multi -stream, uh, single stream uh, facility now and work with uh, Silicon Valley Clean Water to convert that to energy. Isn't that two different organizations? Uh, Silicon Valley Clean Water is part of uh, the county. It's, it's, it's also a JPA, which, you know, waste, the, the waste authority here is part of that JPA. So we're part of it. When we pay our sewage rate, we, we're paying for that. Um, and the, the goal there is to generate not only enough energy, which they're doing today, that will uh, uh, run that whole facility, but also create clean energy that we would then sell off to uh, Peninsula Clean Energy. Okay. Am I correct? You were also the head of the board of the South Bay. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I, I was the chairman for two and a half years, and I, I remain on the board. I stepped down as chairman. In terms of public service, pulling that organization together, helping to pull it together, is that the most important public service goal oh. you have attained? Oh, I, th I think actually, you know, you working others. with the city is, is just, as, and all the residents of the city on their I issues, and we're a full service city with our own police department, public works, et cetera. Uh, you know, I think that that's equally challenging. Okay. So, Atherton, what is the most important action that the city has executed to help prepare for the greater threats of climate change? Well, uh, I, I, I want to answer that in, in a two-part uh, answer. Um, so, so first off, uh, you, know, you asked the question about what, are, what is everybody doing for for climate change. And I think, you know, we're sitting here in front of your new picture uh, with regards to, you know, what Stanford is doing to meet one of the California goals with regards to increasing the energy efficiencies of the buildings. We're doing that with our new civic center and our new library. Our library, uh, which we're getting the bids and we're opening the bids tomorrow, um, is expected to be, it's not going to be quite a net zero building because we're not doing the, the gray water and the, and the black water reprocessing. However, from an energy standpoint, it will be standalone as well as the, the Civic Center is far above the requirements for insulation. It's all radiant heat and it's all, that whole complex will have one heat pump. And so we're really mm -hmm. taking good steps civic-wise to do that. When we need power at one of the other locations, we're 100% clean energy through Peninsula Clean Energy. Uh, and many of our residents have also opted for that, but most of the residents, if not all the residents, are at minimum 50% clean energy, and that re energy level is, is ratcheting up. We also have, at, uh, in each of our residents, when, when, they go, when people go in and they do remodeling, or when people go in and, or build a new house, it has to be built to substantially higher than green, uh, Cal Green standards now. Um, and they have to retain all their water on their property, so we're keeping track of that as well. Uh, lastly, uh, since we talked about trash to start with, I'll just hit this one thing. It, within, within Atherton, 84% of anything that's thrown away is diverted, is diverted from the, from the uh, uh, disposal locations and is recycled. And I think we're doing a pretty good job. Within the SPWMA, we're the leaders in, of all the jurisdictions. Did you think you were going to have a trash-talking conference? <laughs> <laughs> no, I, no, I didn't. We're talking trash. <laughs> so you're building two buildings, a library and a civic center. Correct. And you're making sure they are really up to code or even, Exceed, in many cases, exceeding code. Heating codes, yes. all right. So that's energy efficiency. Right. And reduction maybe in, in the emissions. Right. And then um, the, you've set codes for the city encouraging people who have homes, et cetera. And the state has set rules, hasn't it? Yes, the state passes rules on an annual basis. We, we incorporate that or we, we ask our residents to exceed those. What happens if you do not adhere to the codes of the state? Well, we're a general law city, so we have to by definition. <laughs> They'll shut you down? I don't know if they'd shut us down. They'll sue you? Yeah, I, 
it, well, this, you know, the state has a lot of uh, obligations that they put on general law cities, and in fact, all cities, from, house, from the housing element to, to uh, uh, recycling to organics processing for trash and things like that. Some of those have defined penalties and some of them do not. Um, but we do our best in Atherton. In fact, I have to say we do in Atherton meet all of those needs. Uh, Whatever is laid down there, we meet or exceed. Take, for example, our climate action plan. All the cities in San Mateo County, and I believe across the, the state, all had to develop a climate action plan. And the state required people to do at least a 15% reduction from the, from the benchmark of where they started. We exceeded that. I think we were one of the only, if not the only, uh, community in San Mateo County that put a plan together that exceeded the 15% requirement, which we thought was minuscule. So you know, we, take, we take very seriously what we do uh, and the commitments that we make. And, and um, you know, if you drive around town, you know, we, we, everything from trees to water retention to energy efficient homes to fire protection in the homes. I and mean, we take it very, very seriously and we, we exceed mm. the codes. Good. In the era of Trump, does he really have any effect on your decision-making processes? Uh, I believe that the federal government, if they're making their rules and regulations or relaxing regulations, climate change is being affected by the people. And I, I, I believe in local control, and I believe that it's the people that make a difference. And, and so not only you know, as, as a community, and I'm sure like at, at Palo Alto too, we educate our people, we give them guidelines, and they make good decisions. Now we help, help them along the way to make those decisions, but climate change or really any change is, has to be done from the local level. People don't take well to being dictated to. Okay? People want to make the right decisions, they just need to be educated in how to make the right decisions and what to do. And, and I, I feel very strongly about that. And so, you? So I, I think um, Trump has had an impact locally. It's the inverse of the one he probably meant to have. Um, and that is that we already had a very strong commitment to these measures before Trump. Um, I believe that we're in the process of really elevating that commitment as a result of Trump. Um, we, we had set our own, we had adopted our, our second sustainability and climate action plan two years ago. And, um, and we've actually now that the most standard baseline is the 1990 period. And we've already cut in half our citywide greenhouse gas emissions from that baseline. Uh, but our goal is to have an 80% reduction by 2030. Our city council has just after having adopted the plan has made climate protection one of our top priorities for the next three years. That's above the commitment we had already made. So I, I think uh, we're seeing at the grassroots level leading up to the civic leadership uh, an even greater commitment than we had before. Okay, now your community has a lot of Republicans. And yeah, I tend to think they're very smart and wealthy Some people. of them are now former Republicans. Former <laughs> And I also think people with a lot of money tend to either inherit it or else they're very smart and, and have figured ways to earn it. And what impact has Trump had in your area? You know, I, I think, you know, as, as Pat mentioned, I think that when somebody is causing a ruckus in a certain way, that the natural reaction, if, if you've heard for eight years or 10 years or you believe internally based on your own research that this is the right direction to go and you hear somebody saying, nah, we're not gonna do that anymore, this is all fake, it, it emboldens you to continue moving forward. And, and, and I think, as Pat said, I think, that, I think this area here, not just Atherton and Palo Alto, but I think up and down the coast, you know, people recognize um, you know, what's happening and that, that, the, that the environment is extremely fragile and we need to take care of it. 
And, I, and that's why you see so many volunteers doing things like this. I, I just think that really, it, it, that people become emboldened to say, okay, if I wasn't doing it hard enough now, I'm really gonna do it a lot harder now because you know somebody else is trying to take that away or impact that. So um, I, I, think, I think it's not just you know, Atherton Republicans or Democrats. I think it's just people. And, you okay. know, people here, in, here in, in you know, our beautiful state, people really embrace what God has given to us. And they want to protect it, and they want to protect it for the kids. Good. Now, when you make decisions, from what I can determine, you have your own framework and your own thinking. It does not include, I believe, demonstrating that you folks are a leader and trying to influence other communities. You would agree with that? We do, essentially, for what we think is right. Yeah. And what's going to impact our community, uh, you know, from discussions on, on the rail systems to discussions on other activities. Bringing up rail systems, what is your position on the high-speed rail? I am certainly pleased that somebody in Sacramento showed some sense because okay. that was going to be a financial disaster. It was going to be a financial disaster, and do we need to have a better transportation system? Yes, yes I agree, but that one wasn't, or it wasn't being managed well. Okay. And so, um, you know, as you know, you know, our town spoke out quite uh, loudly about that, and and uh, you know, we're in favor of electrification, and we're in favor of of many things and improving the transportation system, but. That high-speed rail, the way it was sold to the public, and then the way the money was dispersed without being able to prove what they said they were going to go do, we felt was, was inappropriate. Okay. Of course, this is a transportation issue, yeah. and it's, transportation is pretty much tied with buildings with respect to putting up emissions. What is your position and your city's position with respect to the high-speed rail? Well, I think we had a pretty similar viewpoint toward the high-speed rail plan that Bill just articulated. Um, I think that they, are, they may salvage something that, that could be actually beneficial, which is hooking what they've been building in the Central Valley to an, uh, an improved rail system, the ACE corridor from the Central Valley over the Altamont Pass. Not a true high-speed rail system, but uh, an electrified system far faster than what we have. and the funds that are being invested from the high-speed rail dollars toward electrification of Caltrain are the most significant benefit here. That's going to be uh, powered by 100% clean energy. That's wonderful. And what is the status of Caltrain's electrification, and when will we see some benefits from it? 2021 is when it's scheduled to be operable. Okay. Uh, yeah, as you, as you may have noticed going by the rail, Tracks. They've been putting in the posts that are holding the towers. The towers will come next. So what they're doing is they have several teams that are moving forward in a, in a uh, unified manner, going from starting in San Francisco, running on down, and the towers will come after that. Then they'll string the wires. Um, so it's it's moving along quite nicely. All right, 2021. I'll be able to take the train up to. San I said it's scheduled. Now that could be 2022, but I don't. Uh, I don't think it will be pushed out past then. I don't want you to blame me if uh, you can't, no. can't hit your ride. And we'll be back on the show. And, yeah. and we have a new governor, a new administration in Sacramento. What major changes besides a high-speed rail decision that Newsom made? Do you? Well, we'll start with you, Pat. Do you see? coming out of Sacramento? Well, I think that the we certainly are going to see uh, a greater focus out of Sacramento on housing. The question is whether we're going to see that focus be a balance uh, that's really sustainable of the rate of uh, growth in, in tech jobs to the housing. And what we've had in the last decade is had just a, an incredible increase in the rate of tech job growth uh, and a much slower housing growth. Uh, I think that we're going to see an increase in housing growth 
and hopefully we'll see a moderation in the rate of tech job growth. But more relevant to what you have here is the state uh, energy efficiency plans, which are looking toward all new construction in California becoming carbon neutral uh, as either individual projects or as, um, as uh, development areas, and a very aggressive program that by 2030 we're going to have a transformation in the energy efficiency and the local generated clean energy of buildings throughout this state. And if we achieve this as a state, it's going to have a, a global leading model for others to follow. Interesting. Can you link your statement to one of the six goals of California's climate plan? Because I can't easily do that right now. So I'm trying to remember off the top of my head the, the, uh, okay. uh, the goals, but uh, it's, it, it is a, they, they have this specific reduction or increase in energy efficiency uh, in the coming decade. So in the 2030 on the, um, on the goal is we'll have all new construction before then will have been uh, completely energy neutral on site. Good, that's nice to know. And Bill, what changes do you see coming out of the Newsom administration? Well, I think the biggest change and the biggest threat really to the growth of the economy and, and actually everybody's livelihood is the affordable housing issue. And, um, it, you know, there, there are a number of bills. Some people say that, oh, it's not going to pass this year or it's not going to pass next year. You know, it's a freight train coming and it's going to get here whether you, somebody stands in the way of it today or tomorrow. And I think all the communities need to spend some time thinking about that. You know, where and how they're going to do it, how they're going to fund it. Um, you know, there's the Senate bill uh, SB 50 at this point in time that uh, says, you know, here's some guidelines. This is what we'd like you to do. Um, and if you don't think that that matches your community, then you've got a series of years that you can, and it's defined, you have to get community input to decide how you're going to go do it. So there, I think that there's lots of ways to do it, um, but you need to get the community through it, and it can't be from an NIMBY type of approach, you know. Everybody says, yeah, I'm, I'm all for affordable housing, but don't put it here, okay? Yeah. Well, you know, we, we all are going to have to face that. And so I do think that that's one of the biggest things that, that, that uh, the Newsom administration and I think really all of our communities need to face. And I realize it's not necessarily energy efficient. Another one is going to be the cost of education as well. Oh. And so people come here, get educated, uh, but they can't afford it. They're getting out of colleges with, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars in debt. It's a big issue. I think it's a major issue here. Bill Widma, Mayor of Atherton. Thank you very much. Pat no Bird, you'll be mayor again of Palo Alto soon. Hi, I'm Michael Killen. Thank you very much. Thank you, Michael. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank right, you, thanks. Bill. Sorry, the last two things were not energy related. It's but... all right. It's all right. Mm -hmm.